Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, a free site. Uh, bettingangle.us, a free site. Let's talk boxing. Let's talk Canelo against Danny Jacobs. But first, remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, let me just tell you where I stand based on what's been happening at middleweight. It's my belief that the middleweight champ is Gennady Golovkin. Right? I don't care what the powers that be have to say on the issue. Right? I saw the fights. I thought Golovkin beat Canelo twice. Officially, the first fight's a draw. The second fight, Canelo was awarded the victory. Right? I'm not buying the second fight. I thought the second fight was competitive. Make no mistake about it. But I felt that Golovkin did more than enough to win the fight. Canelo did spectacular work to the body, if you look at the film. But I thought Golovkin did an excellent job with his jab up top. And I thought he dictated the flow of that fight. Let me segue here. Let's talk about Canelo for a second. Make no mistake. I consider Canelo to be a Hall of Famer, right? It's clear that in terms of all the fighters in boxing, very few, if any, have fought the level of competition that Canelo has fought on an ongoing basis. You hear about guys who are being avoided in the sport. Austin Trout, Eris Landy Lara, Canelo fought both of them, right? You think about the very best in the sport, Floyd Mayweather. Canelo fought him. Golovkin, Canelo fought him twice. One floor up, the champ at 168 pounds, Rocky Fielding. I'm not saying Fielding is a giant in the sport, but what I am saying is Canelo challenged himself by taking on a guy in a weight class, eight pounds above his. And of course, he's fought other excellent fighters. Miguel Cotto, for example, Canelo fought him. Here's the problem I have with Canelo. And it's a big problem, right? While he's fought and officially beaten big names, while he only has one loss on his record. And understand, that's very impressive when you're fighting both Golovkin and Mayweather. Right? Canelo has won some fights that, quite frankly, could have gone either way. What I want to do here, and I've done it in past videos, is, is encourage people to go back and just look at the CompuBox numbers for the Austin Trout fight, <clears throat> right? Austin Trout is still with us. The boxing press can approach Austin and ask him whether he thought he beat Canelo. Understand that fight was tainted further. And I say further because there's no way you get the judges scorecards with that CompuBox scoring. That fight was tainted further by the fact that you had open scoring. So you had a situation where the fight's competitive. Dare I say, I thought Austin Trout's winning the fight. Then they announced that Canelo's ahead. Understand, both fighters in the last third of the fight understood that Canelo was well ahead in a fight where he was getting outthrown and outlanded. That impacted the fighters' pace. Right? Canelo knew he had the fight in the bag. Another fight I have a problem with, and many of you disagree with me, that's why we're all online, right? Because boxing's a sport of disagreements. And, you know, we all respect each other. I certainly respect your views. 
the Arislandi Lara fight. Now, let's make sure we have one thing clear. Lara at the time, not anymore, but at the time had vastly superior foot speed to Canelo, right? Vastly superior foot speed to Canelo. If you believe Canelo won that fight, you believe that Laura didn't stay in the pocket enough to engage with Canelo enough. But understand, Canelo had a problem, and it matters for this Danny Jacobs fight, with Laura's southpaw stance. He had a problem with Laura's hand speed. He had a problem with Laura's ability to get in, get off some shots, and get out. Dare I say, Canelo, simply put, wasn't the athlete that Arislandi Lara was. Right? I thought the American fight was interesting. Canelo wins that fight, no doubt. I agree with those of you who believe that Canelo spent some time in that fight setting up a trap. Right, Canelo's over there. Canelo is not throwing the right hand. He's slowly getting Khan to be in the wrong position. Then he hits Khan and the fight's over. Okay, great. I had Khan ahead. I'm being charitable here. I had Khan ahead in that fight. I did not see the round in that fight that Canelo won. Now, again, the judges' scorecards tell a different story. Right? What I want boxing fans to do in this day and age, where you're watching Luis Ortiz dominate Deontay Wilder, and then on the scorecards, they have Wilder winning the rounds. You're watching Gerald Washington dominate Deontay Wilder, then on the scorecard, they have Wilder winning the rounds. Right? You watch Kovalev knock down Andre Ward. You understand Andre Ward's behind in that fight. It needs to come back big time. The comeback doesn't happen, but yet somehow Andre Ward in Las Vegas wins every judge's scorecard. Right? The judging right now is terrible. Let's be charitable. Right? It's terrible. There's structural problems right now in boxing that pertain to judges. You know why that is. The promoters control the sport. There are not that many of them. Boxing has very few big names. The people running the sport really aren't the sanctioning bodies. It's the promoters. The judges understand that they need to play along to get along. Hypothetically, the fighters start 0-0. Zero, zero. Realistically, you and I know there's some cash cow fighters in the sport, and Canelo is one of them, who enter the ring with a two-round lead. One of the big questions on this Danny Jacobs-Canelo fight is whether anyone and I mean this, anyone can beat Canelo on the scorecards if the fight goes the distance in Las Vegas. I'm not saying they're handing out memos saying, hey, player, you're the judge. We want Canelo to win, right? I'm not saying there's a mob in the background here secretly pulling strings. But what I am saying is, let's say I'm a judge. Let's say I want to be a part of the big events, right? I get tapped for the event. I'm getting comped in a city like Las Vegas. The fight starts. I know who the favorite is. I know who the box office guy is, right? My, my scorecards for close rounds are going to shade toward the box office guy. It's an international problem. Let's not kid ourselves. I'm still trying to figure out the scorecard for 
Joshua versus Povetkin. Right? There again. Joshua wins by KO. No one's saying that Joshua didn't win that fight. But what I am saying is, wow, you saw some rounds where the challenger clearly wins the round. <laughs> Certainly the champ didn't do anything to win the round. And they don't score a 10-10. They give it to the cash cow. They give it to the house fighter. I would argue here in this video that in Las Vegas, and I know Canelo is Mexican, but in Las Vegas, Canelo's the house fighter. And understand, this is bigger than Canelo because before him, Floyd Mayweather was the house fighter. Before him, Oscar De La Hoya was the house fighter. Just track who fights on Cinco de Mayo weekend in Las Vegas because that fighter is going to be one of the biggest cash cows in boxing. And I'm just telling you, there's a pattern. There's a built-in bias to the system. And I understand there are boxing commissions, and I understand these judges are all independent, and they're selected on a per-fight basis. Look, I get the theory. I'm just telling you that Danny Jacobs is going to enter the ring here at a two-round disadvantage against Canelo, right? The fact that we all watched the American Canelo fight, and there are people out there who believe that that fight was even at the time of the knockout. How's that? What exactly did Canelo do to even warrant a draw? Let's talk about another fight. I understand some of these fights are in different cities. Freddie Roach has been around a long time. He had a fighter who had been a champion, who had a great resume, who is a future Hall of Famer, Miguel Cotto. To the boxing press, Miguel Cotto is still with us. Talk to him about his fight against Canelo. Now, I understand there's some big names out there, Floyd Mayweather, for example, who saw Cotto Canelo and who thought Canelo won the fight, right? I'm just telling you, and Freddie Roach is still with us, talk to him. I'm just telling you that both Cotto and Roach thought that Cotto was winning the fight. That's a significant fight because even though Cotto fights out of a orthodox stance, his money punch is his left hand. Folks, his left hand was landing that fight. In other words, Canelo against Southpaw Lara couldn't stop the left. Canelo against Southpaw Cotto couldn't stop the left. He's now facing a switch. While I expect Annie Jacobs, the underdog, and he's a big underdog. This is a bubble, right? How is Danny Jacobs a bigger than two to one underdog, right? This is a guy who stopped Kid Chocolate in the first or second round. This is a guy who's been at middleweight, dominating much longer than Saul Alvarez has. Right? Let me just say, I expect Danny Jacobs to enter the ring down two rounds. Let's be real here. Right? There's another dynamic with Canelo. There's some fighters who you expect to be dominant. Right? The expectations are very high. Right? You look at a Mayweather. You look at a Ward. And unless they're absolutely dominating the opponent, you'll be thinking to yourself, oh, he's having an off night. Right? Our expectations are really high. It's kind of like a come show us type thing. Alexander Usyk, Vasyl Lomachenko. That's not Saul Alvarez. Saul Alvarez is from the other side of the ledger, isn't he? 
and I know I'm going to get a lot of negative ratings. Sounds good. Let's just keep it real. Alvarez is an overachiever. You look at him, and you think, wow, he's a little short. Right? You look at him, he has hand speeds in bursts. But you don't think of him as being gifted in terms of his hand speed. You look at him, there have been fights, big fights, where he's taking rounds off, right? His fight against El Perro. I'm naming the fight, so if people want to call me out on it, they can go and look at the fight themselves. Where Canelo's taking minutes off of the fight. Right? His stamina is an elite. Let's face it, too. We've seen him undressed in a fight. The Floyd Mayweather fight, this is part of the public record. After six rounds, ESPN's Dan Rayfield said he had Mayweather ahead 6 0. Folks, the fight's not competitive. The biggest scare Floyd Mayweather has in that fight is he goes to his corner at one point, and I believe his father's in the corner, and Floyd's in discomfort, and the father says, it's the hand, isn't it? Right? Floyd was hitting Canelo so often, Floyd hurt his hand. No, with, with Saul Alvarez, we root for him because he is an underdog. Right? He doesn't come in the ring you know, viewed as alpha, right? He's not Golovkin. We don't look at him and say, hey, you're the best. He's not prime Roy Jones. We don't look at him and say, wow, you're the best. You're beating everyone by a mile. Show us you're the best again. Right? Floyd Mayweather gets hit, doesn't hit the canvas, gets hit his knees buckle twice when he's hit by Shane Mosley. Floyd then writes the ship, practically shuts out Shane Mosley the last eight rounds of the fight. Right? Shut out. You know the rest. After the fight, all anyone wanted to talk about, all anyone wanted to talk about, was Floyd's knees buckling early in the fight, not the adjustments he made, not the brilliance he showed later. Now, with Saul Alvarez, it's different. We watch Amir Khan come out and have a fast start against him. We notice the hand speed gap. We notice Saul Alvarez has problems with Amir Khan's movement just like he had problems with Arislandi Lara's movement. We see it. All we want to talk about is the fact that Saul Alvarez stopped him. Right? All of us realize that Saul Alvarez is a gamer. He's a warrior. There's no question about that. He wants to fight the best. He wants to be his best. There's no question about that. We celebrate that. He's the underdog we like to root for. That's very different, folks. That's extremely different than Vasyl Lomachenko, who when he's in the ring, you're thinking, okay, this guy's the gold standard. Right? You're expecting dominance and brilliance, not an overachieving underdog. By the way, I call Canelo an underdog. He's never an underdog, it seems, in Vegas on the betting line. What? We, we root for him. He's, he's like the politician who you get the feeling doesn't quite know the issues, doesn't quite know the math as well as an opponent. 
but who you feel, right? Despite his imperfections, you feel he has the same values as you, right? We had a president here in the United States who we call the Teflon president, Ronald Reagan, right? People understood that Reagan didn't come from academia. He was an actor. Reagan was an immensely popular president. Look at the 1984 presidential results. Look at the Electoral College. But if you lived during that period of time, you understood that when you talked about the Gipper, you knew there were policy wonks behind him. He wasn't the guy who had to present himself like Barack Obama did later. Right With Obama, you felt that he was the finished product, not his team. Right, Barack Obama at press conferences couldn't mispronounce the names of other foreign leaders. You saw Obama and you thought Harvard. Right, you thought editor of the Harvard Law Review. Not he's delegating to other people, right? You saw Reagan's vice president, and you thought, okay, you know, George H.W. Bush is the intellectual behind him. By contrast, you saw Obama's vice president, Joe Biden, and you thought to yourself, whoa, nothing better happened to Barack Obama. Because he's clearly the captain of the ship. Now, with Canelo, we root for him because of his imperfections. I know that sounds a little bit hard, but, you know, it's because he's a little bit undersized. It's because when he's fighting a Floyd Mayweather, you understood Mayweather, better defense, better hand speed, better foot speed, better athlete. You understood all that. But the one thing you knew with certainty was that Canelo was there to win the fight, right? Because Canelo's a warrior. Well, I believe here he's bitten off more than he can chew. While I believe that Golovkin beat him twice, quite frankly, I, I didn't buy the first fight being a draw, right? While I believe Golovkin beat him twice, I believe Golovkin's style meshes more closely with Canelo's style than does Danny Jacobs' style. Of all the fights Canelo has had, right, of all the fights Canelo has had, this fight is the worst possible matchup for him. Right? Jacobs is taller than Canelo. He's the better athlete than Canelo. Jacobs can fight long. In other words, he can land a jab and be far enough away from Canelo where Canelo doesn't have a shot at hitting his body. Unlike Golovkin, Golovkin's primarily a hunter. Understand Jacobs has a much more developed back foot game, both from his orthodox stance, he's right-handed, and from a southpaw stance. And I believe southpaws give Canelo a hard time. More importantly, this fight to me is widely misunderstood. Understand, if you follow Danny Jacobs' career, you know he's a puncher. I would say Jacobs is a puncher boxer more than he is a boxer puncher. As I said, he takes out Kid Chocolate early in a battle for Brooklyn. That was a high profile New York City fight, right? Danny Jacobs is a guy who knocks you out. He's gonna see a shorter, slower moving guy. And I'll agree, Canelo can work in, bur in bursts, but he's gonna see a shorter, slower moving guy with less stamina, and it's going to be Sunday morning, right? Even with the disadvantage 
on the judge's scorecards. And there'll be a disadvantage. As I said, Vegas has a long history of loving the popular fighter. I'm expecting Danny Jacobs to win this fight, possibly by stoppage. Right? I think another problem for Canelo is he changed his style for the second Golovkin fight. He decided to be front foot heavy, to continually collapse the pocket, to come forward. Now that worked against Golovkin in the second fight, if you believe the judges' scorecards. Canelo also was able to get inside on the body. Now Golovkin has worked on his jab, but Golovkin's jab is not close to Danny Jacobs' jab. Right? I'm just telling you, Canelo also, same strategy against Rocky Fielding. I'm just telling you that if Canelo thinks he can collapse the pocket on Danny Jacobs, and he's a different type fighter than Golovkin, who throws punches at weird angles, if Canelo looks at the Golovkin film of Golovkin's victory over Danny Jacobs, where Golovkin knocks Jacobs down, but Jacobs gets off the canvas and becomes the first guy to go the distance with Golovkin in a long time. Many people believe Jacobs won that fight. Jacobs believes he beat Golovkin. If Canelo thinks he can duplicate Golovkin's strategy of collapsing the pocket on Danny Jacobs continually, he's going to get stopped. Right? You cannot walk in on Danny Jacobs. Let me also say this too. The Derevianchenko fight is a little bit misleading. First, let me say this. Derevianchenko, excellent fighter. The fact that Danny Jacobs beat him should set off red flags for every bookmaker who has made Danny Jacobs a better than two-to-one underdog. But understand, Drevianchenko trains with Danny Jacobs. <laughs> the two guys know each other. This wasn't the first time they were in the ring. So Drevianchenko understood, and he's excellent at collapsing the pocket. He understood how to survive against Danny Jacobs. As far as I know, this is the first time Canelo has been in the ring with Danny Jacobs. I think Jacobs is going to keep him outside. I think Jacobs is going to then switch the angles up on him. And I'm telling you, Canelo is not the same fighter. Just not the same fighter against a southpaw. I think Canelo is going to be struck by how hard Danny Jacobs is to find and how hard Jacobs hits. Right? By the middle of this fight, I'm expecting even the judges in Vegas to understand that we have a situation here. That the underdog is taking over the fight. Second half of the fight, Jacobs might put on a show. Understand, I thought in the middle rounds of the first Golovkin fight, Golovkin puts on a show against Canelo, right? Canelo gets the draw because of a second wind he gets in that fight. And because Golovkin thought he was so far ahead that he starts to cruise a little bit, right? I don't think Golovkin understood what Kovalev knows well. That if you're a foreign-born person fighting the house fighter in Las Vegas, you're going to have problems on the scorecards. Well, I'm expecting the same dynamic to play out here, right? The difference is, let's face it, Jacob's better on his back foot than Golovkin, right? Style-wise. You can find Golovkin's body a lot more than you can find Jacobs' body. In that first fight, Golovkin's trading with Canelo. Canelo's able to land some shots. Golovkin is there, trading. In this fight, 
Danny Jacobs is going to be doling out punishment and changing the angle. I'm not even expecting Canelo to be able to trade with him that much. Right? So make no mistake. I've gone out on a limb and the branch fell off in some fights recently. I did have Christina Hammer over Clarissa Shields. I did have Mikey Garcia over Errol Spence. Right? I've had my share of car crashes. Right? Worse yet, I had Tyson Fury over Wilder. I still don't know how I didn't collect on that fight. Right? I had Golovkin in both fights over Canelo. I still don't know how I didn't collect on either fight. So it's been bumpy here. But I'm not backing down. The bet I'm recommending here is the underdog. To win the fight, Canelo only has a puncher's chance. I'll hedge to play with Canelo by KO. But I need for you to understand the risk. It's awfully hard. Unless your name's Floyd Mayweather and you're the house fighter at the time of the fight in Las Vegas, it's awfully hard to beat Canelo on the scorecards in Las Vegas. Right? That's kind of like beating Jeff Horn on the scorecards in Australia. Right? It's awfully hard. Just understand we're swimming upstream against the politics. Right? But I'm just telling you, there's a gap between these two fighters. Canelo has a problem with length. Canelo has a problem with movement behind a jab. Canelo is going to have to try to collapse the pocket. Danny Jacobs wants you. His trainer, Rosier, wants you to walk in on Danny Jacobs so Jacobs can have you walking into some shots, right? The dynamic here is different than the Golovkin dynamic. I do think Jacobs is mistaken when he says that Golovkin clearly hits harder than Canelo, right? As I've said here online for years, I think Canelo is one of the hardest punchers in boxing. But I will say I believe Golovkin has what I call more ring coverage than Canelo. Right? I think the trajectory of Golovkin shots are harder to read than the trajectory of Canelo's shots. Right, I think the things Golovkin did in the early rounds against Jacobs, when he's winning the fight before Jacobs gets off the canvas and makes adjustments, are very hard to duplicate. I think Canelo saw the first part of the Jacobs-Golovkin fight and thinks he can duplicate what Golovkin did there. I think he's mistaken. I like the underdog here. I'm going to hedge the play with Golovkin, excuse me, with Canelo by stoppage. But understand, if I had one bet to make, it would be Danny Jacobs straight up. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you've Leave your comments in the comment section of this video. Let me say this too. There are a few fighters out there who really conjure up a lot of loyalty from their fans. Right? Anthony Joshua comes to mind. Many of you feel that Luis Ortiz was afraid. That's the word. Afraid to accept Joshua's offer to fight him in New York City. Right? Not that it was negotiating, but that a heavyweight in a sport where the goal is to be champion, was too afraid of the champion to accept the challenge, right? Likewise, Canelo fans believe that he's a Sugar Ray Robinson type figure, right? And feel that when I say things like, on my scorecard, Lara beat him, that I'm being blasphemous, that I'm not giving him his due. I'll just tell you, when they announced the scoring at the end of the Golovkin-Canelo rematch, I was at a Hooters in Campbell, California. By the way, great place to watch a fight. I don't own the place. I'm just...
telling fans who want to come out on uh, fight nights. It was a Canelo crowd. When they announced the scoring, the outcome, the mood in the room was subdued. Right? Even Canelo fans felt that something was off with the scoring of the Golovkin Canelo rematch. Now, in real time, in real time, Canelo is king, El Rey, right? I'm just here to tell you that beneath the surface, there are people who feel that Laura beat Canelo, that Golovkin beat Canelo. One of those people is Danny Jacobs, right? He's going to enter the ring feeling that he's in against a guy who has gotten some gift decisions. Read Danny Jacobs' pre-fight comments. Understand, Jacobs has a long history. He's not a trash talker. He doesn't normally say stuff like this before a fight. Here, he's clearly saying he thought Lara beat him, he thought Golovkin beat him twice. Right? Jacobs, of course, wants to fight Golovkin after he fights Canelo. Right? Danny's not buying the hype. This is a dangerous opponent. This is a dangerous underdog. I like the underdog here. Hedged with the favorite by KO. Thanks for stopping by.